All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next uh, profound episode of the Lion's Den of Leadership podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Steve Rosenberg. Steve? Hey, how you doing, my man? Oh, he is in the good mood today. We're on for a good one. And today, well, so let's just step back for a second. The purpose of this podcast, if those of you who are just tuning in have no idea what this is all about, well, we're going to discuss, um, we're going to break down leadership into its components and attempt to go and dig deeper into um, life and success of an entrepreneur, as well as the failures, right? We'll examine those. We'll find nuggets of wisdom. We'll surface them out for you to grab and take advantage of. And so today, we are uh, going to talk with Mike Catalano. Mike, how are you? Hey, fellas. How's it going? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Is that what we're talking about today? Talking Mike Catalano. <laughs> well, let, let me intro Mike. Um, let me intro Mike, if you don't mind, Steve. Um, so I've known Mike since 2009, I believe. This is where I, as, an op, as a young and very um, optimistic Opfolio representative, walked into his company uh, to try to convince him to go from stone age into digital age and sell him Opfolio property management software. Well, that whole relationship worked pretty, pretty well. Um, you know, over time, over time, it took a couple of months, but you know, he, he was convinced. We needed to convince his dad. His dad got convinced as well. We, we made the migration. I, I think that was a successful implementation. And from there, uh, Mike has been um, a friend, a business partner, um, uh, throughout the next you know, decade of my life, we built a lot of things together, and here we are um, going to dissect him a little bit and see what makes him tick and what makes him successful, so all of us can take away some useful stuff. Right? Does that sound good, Mike? Yeah, that's pretty much how it went. Although you know, I was very familiar with that polio. You just uh, ultimately were the lucky one in the right place, right time. No, just good. kidding. No, you did a great job. You were very easy to, to chat with and discuss it and. We knew it was a change we would make eventually. Uh, I was kind of waiting for Apollo to get through their beginning stages and mistakes, uh, and then here we are. So yes, yeah. Back then, Apollo was just you know just had an accounting and and maybe just a couple other features, but it's really limited software. Obviously, they were just starting out. Um, I started with a company with only a few, I think eighteen employees or twenty two when I started, so it was small. I get it. There was a lot of risk on your end to take on that uh, that software at the time with a company your size. I mean, you guys were not small. Were you like 600, 800 units back then, Mike? Probably 500, maybe. 500. Yeah, it was, we weren't that, we hadn't reached the, where we are now, but we were, you know, at that time, that was considered a larger company. Obviously, larger companies have a different meaning now, but uh, uh, that's kind of where we were. And, you know, just, we were just afraid of the transfer. We were afraid of how to take all this money. We were, we were on Yardi. We were past DOS, at least. We were on Yardi, and we were transferring over. Yardi, at that time, didn't have a cloud-based software. So, And, of course, cloud-based, most people were afraid of. I had a cloud-based software that we built. I had a friend of mine who was a, a web designer. He built a cloud-based software for me internally. It didn't have the accounting side, but I knew this was something we needed to be able to track things that were happening because everything was done on paper, and I'm not a big paper fan. So I knew it was going to happen, uh, and you know, it was just the right timing. So it worked out. And... I felt like the risk part we were worried about was the trust account, but ultimately it worked out pretty well. We find, found a really good uh, consultant that Appfolio recommended and she helped us through the process and everything ultimately went fine. Um, the hard part, I was having a kid at the same time. Mm. So we were transferring on January one and I had a kid on January four. So it was a pretty interesting time to, uh, to deal with taking call. I actually took Appfolio calls in the delivery room. Mm. my wife looking at me and she's a, a Google exec. So she looked at me and understands how we work. And she looked at me and she said, all right, take the call. <laughs> so she knew what, we had a little problem with the trust account we got, but we got it taken care of. So long story short, it ended up being really working out really well. And hence we kept in contact. And of course what our BDMs are realizing not to transition is that when you sign up a client and there has a problem with the software or whatever, or the service, who do they call? They call the person who signed them up, right? right. So Alex right. got a lot of calls from us and, and me and saying, Alex, this isn't going right. How do I do this? And, you know, he kind of diffused the situation and made it uh, work out real well. That's what I really liked about the company. Steve, what was your, since we are in the subject of 
software conversions. What was the most significant software implementation for your company that took a while and now you're very thankful you've done? That's a good question. Um, well, first I would say my congratulations on, on having the baby. That must have really, that must have hurt. So uh, I'm glad that that worked out okay. And you were able to make the phone calls. So, and you had Alex by your side. So times have changed. Um, uh, but going back to your, you know, it's interesting when you were talking, I was just thinking in my mind, cause I'm, I'm kind of back in that sales and marketing mode. Cause I stepped back in as, as VP of sales and marketing uh, at Empire. And What's interesting is, is basically Mike, what Alex did, I'm guessing so eloquently is Mike didn't have a problem or realize he had a problem until Alex maybe brought it to the forefront. And, and one thing I've always learned is people don't do what they should, they do what they have to. So Mike knew he should transfer, but didn't have to transfer until maybe Alex, maybe I don't know what it is he did, but maybe brought it to the forefront, whatever reason, brought enough value to say, you know what, this is something you have to do, not something you should do. And so it's just, that's sales, right? That's sales 101 is showing the client that sometimes you have to let them know you do have a problem, you don't even see it. And all of a sudden the client goes, shit, I really do have a problem. I guess, I guess this is now something I have to do, not something I should do. So I think it's interesting that, that because that sales is on my mind, BDMs, all that stuff. Um, but anyways, going back to your original question, Alex, I would say, technology you know we're, we're I live with next door to a to an engineer that, that everything to him is a system and a process right um, I talk about going to lunch and he wants to know what is the system for us to what's the procedure for us to get to lunch you know type thing and you know we're in the middle of, of these checklists that, that Pete creates and Pete is very good at understanding what needs to be done in the procedure what needs to be caught and then how do you systemize it in a checklist format, which is digital, um, that he's working with um, uh, developers and such to make sure that we can have it and it's scalable with multiple people with their hands in the pot. So, you know, we, we have virtual assistants in Mexico, we have this, we have this. A lot of people, obviously, you know, in the property management world, there's a lot of procedures and sometimes a lot of hands in the pot. And that can be great, but it can also show a lot of ineffectiveness. Um, and so the checklists are there to give standardization. So obviously when a system changes, a software, an idea, a whoops, whatever happens, now we got to go back and we got to change that software. We got to, you know, we got to change a step in the process. We, something has to change. So it's a, it's an ever evolving software change. But, but I am very glad that we have it because it has definitely made our business scalable, not only to have properties in multiple cities, but to have staff members in multiple cities and we can give the same deliverable product everywhere we go. And that, that was the key to doing that. Mm, very interesting. So you, you basically right now, it's the biggest challenge that you found is actually developing your own system to make sure that your operations are tight, consistent, repeatable, and eventually profitable. Correct. Correct. Because you know, the, the biggest challenge is, you know, as you grow, systems break and people break. And they say, you know, 50% of your people and 50% of your systems will break during growth mode. You speed up your growth mode, you're speeding up the breaking of things. And you, you have to be okay with that and realize that, you know, you're going to piss off owners, you're going to piss off employees, you're going to break systems. That's part of the growth mode and you have to understand the, the, the context of it. And sometimes it's hard, right? Sometimes you don't like losing owners. You know, and we, you know, we went through a whole mode of losing owners because we were changing so many things. We started implementing systems, but, you know, the checklists are there to be the spinal cord of the operation and so that the systems can, can spawn off of that if, that, if that kind of makes sense. And you have to look at the bigger picture. Do I want to keep one person happy or do I want to keep a thousand people happy? And that's, that's what the systems and the checklist do. Mike, what is your approach? You have a little bit diff different approach to running a business. Uh, your growth seems to be just buying up companies. Um, is that, is that, has that changed? I mean, what are you thinking moving forward? And, and so maybe clue the audience in into sort of your operation and, and how do you see growth in, in your own businesses? So look, as we've talked about many times, I'm always looking for acquisitions. Um, we've also talked about how many I've looked at and how many we've actually purchased. It's a big difference. It's a big number as far as how many I'm looking at versus how many I'm, I'm acquiring. So you have to have the other growth available, the direct sales growth. Um, you have to make sure that's uh, you have to have the processes in place. 
And, you know, I have a few different companies and they all run a little differently. And I only do that because the area, which you know, we're in different, three different cities in, in California, the areas might call for a different type of service, a uh, different type of people, different type of investors. Um, I think we were talking before we, we jumped on air here is, uh, you know, I'm one of the companies in Silicon Valley. I have to have a different approach on how I pay my employees because I'm competing with the, with Facebook and Google and all these big companies here. I mean, Netflix is like a quarter mile for me. Um, <clears throat> so we have all these big companies and we need to make sure we can pay our employees. So I have to have a different process and a different operation here. Um, when I acquire a company, I really look at their process and I don't change a whole lot until we get, I, I really get into the nitty gritty. I don't like to have a lot of change until it's time, but you do have to have, you know, we have the natural attrition that we've all talked about is, you know, probably five to 15% a year that we're all going to lose, whether it's through sales, or it's through you know owner not liking us or the owner moving back in. And we have a lot of that in Silicon Valley because people leave for two or three years on contract and they come back in <clears throat> to the area. So we have to have a natural way of getting new business. So the acquisitions are great, um, but I think you still have to have the marketing side of things together. And of course, obviously, you know, Alex, your team does a great job and helps us uh, and all three companies uh, get that more organic growth uh, whether it's through, you know, content or pay-per-click and, and Google AdWords and things like that. So you have to have that in place as well. Yeah, it's, it's the steady feed. You got to have that steady, you got to have that water running through the hose all the time. And then when you get a big, you know, when you get the tidal wave in, you get the tidal wave, but it, you never stop, you never shut the feed off. And I remember, you know, Al, and, and Alex did a great job four and a half when, when we were getting started, me understanding the concept of marketing, because, you know, despite what you may think, they don't teach you this in airline pilot school to learn how to market and sell, right? So I had to learn. So I would pick Alex's brain. I remember he and I would spend a lot of nights, you know, at NARPM events or at the bar talking. And I was just really trying to understand the marketing. And the, the best thing I learned from Alex is that it's a continual flow. You can't just turn it on and turn it off. You've got to be committed to marketing and, and basically more important, not just marketing, but establishing yourself as the expert by continually educating people so that it kind of sells itself. So that it makes the you know, we'll talk about the BDM. It makes the BDM's life a lot easier when they tell an owner, hey, have you had a chance to look at all our video blogs on our website? And they go, I did. That's why I called you. And you go, okay, we've already got the sale. They're already sold on us, basically, is, is what I've learned from Alex. And that was, that was a huge flipping point for me of being able to understand having the, the, the internet basically sell for you because you're going on there as the expert and you're going on there as the educator, as opposed to just saying, look how great I am. Look at all my trophies. Look at my cats. I mean, whatever it is you do on your website, but it, do, it doesn't, it doesn't solve their problem. So going back to what Alex said earlier, the reason he was able to close you on that folio is at some level, he showed you that you do have a problem and that that folio is the solution. You may have walked in that meeting thinking, I don't have a problem. Same thing with clients. You know, you talk to clients, they may not realize they have a problem. Your job, in my opinion, is sometimes to explain to them, you do have a problem. This is your problem. And all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, I didn't realize I had that. Can you help me? Actually I can, because that's exactly what we do best. Yeah. So that, I think that's, that's the kind of the difference in, in you know, what Alex explained to me to, to what I thought sales and marketing was. Hmm. Well put. Um, let's shift on to the next. So I think marketing is pretty well both of you gentlemen, including myself, are very sort of focused on making sure that we continually educate. I mean, hence this podcast, right, Steve? We continually educate and, and we provide helpful content. We get a lot of uh, business that way. Fine. What happens when that inquiry comes in? I think that's where the breakage happens in 95% of the property management companies that I know, right? Yeah. This is where the breakage happens. Steve, talk me through that process Sure. And, and what, what do you see as an opportunity and what, like, let, let's look three years ago and now. Yeah, that's a great question. Cause you know, it's, it's funny. Um, we're, we're going through and we're kind of revamping this because we're trying to squeeze more juice out of the orange, if you will, of leads that come in. Um, so we, for, first of all, I, I think it's important for people to understand the power of being number one on Google, being, being that first person. And, you know, Alex, you probably know statistics better, but, you know, the, I tell people, you know, the, you have, my understanding is you have three seconds from the time they're scrolling on that Google page to go click. The first thing that makes them go click is reviews, right? If they say this company has two reviews and this company has 500 reviews, 
instinctively, we're going to go with the company that has 500 reviews. No question about it. No question about it, right? Without me even selling, I've done that, right? So that's the first phase. The second phase is, and, and again, Alex, I'm, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding, the whole reason a website exists, the whole reason it exists is it's a conversion tool. It's a reason for someone to click, raise their hand and go, I want to use, I want more information. So they're sold that they're another step in the sales process. So what people don't understand is these are actual steps in the sales process. Now, as we know, many people don't even have that sales step process, so they don't realize that. But I think it's important to realize what is the main reason of this website is to get people to actually click and go, I would like to know more information. I'm raising my hand. I'm interested. So then once it, once they click, where does that go? So, you know, lead simple. Jordan's got a fantastic site and in, in what he does. I use HubSpot, you know, the, the half six, one half dozen, the other. But the question is, is when that lead comes in, where does it go? So the, we want to make sure that within five minutes, someone is reaching back out to that person. So from us, from a marketing standpoint, just numbers wise, we are bringing in about 200 inbounds a month. Now an inbound could be, it, it could be somebody that says, I would like to understand the word real estate. I don't know it. I, I would like to know more. It could be, I own a trailer park. It could be, I have an apartment complex. It doesn't necessarily mean it's our target, but we're getting the, the filter, you know, is bringing in about 200 a month. So then we have to figure a way, how do we decipher that filter? How do we get back to them immediately? So whether it's an immediate email response or, or an immediate text message through the CRM system, and then we want to know, okay, we want to get them within five minutes. So HubSpot is able to say, you talk to them, what time did, did, our, did our outbound people get a hold of them to at least touch them once? to let them know we're alive, we're here. So we track that, that's a KPI. How quickly are we getting back to these leads? Then the question is, is how do you qualify? Is it, we call it a lead or an opportunity. A lead is just someone that wants to know about real estate. Basically, they do not have a property that we can manage today. So technically they don't fit in our criteria for today. So that's a lead, so that goes into a drip campaign. The next is a opportunity. That is someone that has something that we can actually manage and it fits our price point. It fits everything. So if somebody contacted Mike and they said, Hey, I've got a house in Phoenix, Arizona, he would go, well, that's great. Can't really help you. So the, the question for Mike would be is how can you help? Him? Like, could you talk to him and go, Hey, have you ever thought of buying something up here in where I live, Los Gatos and say, this is the reason why it makes sense. So technically it's a lead, but you could convert that person into an opportunity by turning them into a sale and then turning them into a, a client. So again, there are a lot of things happen in that point. Um, and the way we do it is, is we still have not had the BDM talking to that person yet. We, we have someone else that does that initial call um, and they all, all the information goes into the CRM. And then from there, the appointment is set by that person. We use a virtual assistant. Um, the appointment is set by that person on the BDM's calendar. My opinion is the BDM makes money for the company when they're closing deals. Not when they're doing CMAs, not when they're creating management agreements. I, they make their money when they're talking and negotiating. So my thoughts are when you have a BDM, what is it that's their strength and what is their weakness? So as you know, in disc profiling, you know, a BDM, a solid BDM is gonna be a high I with D, meaning they're very social, they talk, they chat, but they'll close the deal. So, you know, Mike and I were talking the other day about a BDM and, and, and how do you pay them. I think the first thing is, is do you have the right BDM? Do you have the right person for the role? Because if you have a BDM and you want them to create data and paperwork and CMAs, that's not a salesperson's profile. You want to utilize their, their strengths, but then you also want to offset their weakness with someone else. And that's why we use like, we use virtual assistants to offset that because we feel that the best way to do that is play to their strengths, not... Don't make them change because to me, it's careful what you ask for, right? If you sell the BDM, hey, you got to put in your reports every day. You've got to fill out your management agreements. You got to do that. All of a sudden, they stop closing. And now you're happy because you got your reports, you got your documentation. But now the reason you even have them on payroll or why you have them is they're not even closing deals because you turn them into someone else. You took them out of a sales. And a lot of people that run operations, they want their I's dotted and T's crossed, rightfully so. It makes sense. But you got to be careful what you're deconstructing in the salesperson itself because the salesperson is an animal of its own as we all know they're, they're, they're a certain type of person that you got to let them run you got to let them do what they know how to do and you have to equip them with the tools that they need to be successful 
Yeah, and I think even just to add on that, if you even take this a step backwards, do most people even have a BDM? Because that's been that's the, a, big, the biggest change in the industry, point. right? And it's funny to me because I haven't had one for that long. I mean, we probably had one a little over maybe a year and a half mm -hmm. and had somebody working in the Los Gatos office. Um, and it's so funny to us, me looking back now, at the industry have, that hasn't had this, and, and you're wondering, how in the heck did we not have this? Yeah. Why, why wasn't I doing this, right? I mean, it was either myself, or originally we had property managers. We, we did use, we do use Lead Simple, and the call would come in, and would rotate through all the property managers. But what happens then? You, they get busy, they're working on trying to rent properties, you know, talking to owners, tenants, following up on work orders, and those things started getting lost in the shuffle. And then we're wondering why, we are you're not you know, growing at the, 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 uh, the speed that we should. And I think that was really interesting because we also didn't have numbers. And Alex and I talked to this as well early, early on when Four and a Half was just in its inception is that I was doing marketing and I had no clue how it was working. So I was just getting calls. I didn't know where they're coming from. I didn't know how they were coming in. And then who was supposed to be, yeah, and who was supposed to be following up on it. So I think we're spending so much money on marketing and marketing is going to continue to get more and more expensive because you have all these big companies coming into play. Yep. We have two or three huge big ones here in Silicon Valley alone that are making my pay-per-click ads skyrocket is how much I have to pay in, on Google. So, you know, some, something to, some, just something to think about, and this is for a lot of people out there that, that are, have their property managers doing the sales side, is you gotta ask yourself, normally the disc profile of a property manager is a C, maybe even a CS, maybe a CD. They're not an I, so they're not salespeople. So they're not going to, they're probably, they're going to be good at operations, but they're not going to be good at sales. So then you got to ask yourself, okay, how many sales, meaning dollars, are we losing because we don't have that person? And, and for me, and I don't know about you, Mike, or you, Alex, is every time we've had a problem in our company, it's because there's been no focus on that problem right? We had a problem with maintenance. Next thing you know, we created a maintenance division that, and when I say maintenance division, not maintenance employees, but people to focus on service tickets and make sure we're getting stuff done, closing them. That is their only focus. And when we had them as their only focus, all of a sudden things started getting fixed, right? When, when, if you want to do sales and marketing and you want to grow the, you know, if, if you don't know those numbers, then you don't know if you're growing or not. Real reality is, is you're probably wasting a lot of money and a lot of time and resources doing what you're doing as opposed to going, you know what? Let me hire someone, meaning a BDM, that knows what they're doing, that can close these deals. Yes, it's, I don't even look at it as spending money. I look at it as investing because you're going to invest money in the BDM and you're going to get a return out of them. But you, you just put eyes on a problem that you weren't really even looking at before or know it existed. So you're right. I mean, I think the fact that the, the industry is evolving. And I would tell people that if they are not evolving and they don't start learning sales and marketing, I think at the end of the day, every company out there, I don't care what they sell, is a sales and marketing company. They either sell a product or a service. They have a different widget. But Alex is a sales and marketing person. He's got to get out there. He's got to get in front of people. He's got to make them known. And then he's got to close them. Same thing with us. Same thing with United Airlines. Same thing with Coca-Cola. It doesn't matter. Everybody has to market their product and sell it. We just sell something different, right? We sell something different than Alex sells. But at the end of the day, that really is what we are. And if your phone is not ringing, you're going out of business. You just don't realize it yet until your bank account says zero or negative, And you're like, oh shit, by that time, momentum is so far beyond you. You're never going to catch up. And I think that's the challenge is I think that in the property management industry, and Mike, you, you've been in this longer than I have, you know, this was started by a lot of operators. So a lot of operators create the best management company, but what they don't realize it and now with the internet and, and companies out there that can explode you like Alex can, all of a sudden you realize that just because you create a great product doesn't mean you're going to stay in business. I mean, look, I could put a hamburger stand next to McDonald's. I would go out of business because they can out market me. They don't make a better burger but they cannot market me because they understand sales and marketing better than I do for their product. And I think that's the thing people mistake is they think they, because they do it so well, because we have a great product, because I'm the nice guy. And I, I personally call each owner. If you can't get that message across to them in, in a way that conveys it, that they have a problem and that is a solution. It's just a matter of time until you go out of business, I think. And I think people are realizing that now, Mike, by people realizing like I need a BDM. Yeah. And absolutely. And, and, and Alex would, Oh, we love this part, but sales is, it's an art and it's a science and yeah. it's not just, I got a phone call and they signed the contract. 
I mean, sometimes that happens, but most of the time people are, you know, just doing some research or fishing a little bit and you need someone who continues to follow up. And that doesn't happen when I had the property managers do it. And it's no knock on them at all. I mean, they're just, they're doing their jobs. Right. And it's the follow up is tedious when it comes to BDM. And these are things I'm learning over the last couple of years is really setting up processes involved in how you follow up, how, you know, sending them all our videos and our content and things like that. But having one person assigned to that or multiple, I mean, we have a couple here, um, depending on how many leads are coming in, but it's really important that you have someone that's handling that. Because if you lose those leads that you pay for, you know, your client acquisition cost goes skyrocketing through the roof because you're getting all these leads and not closing them. And, and I've always learned, you know, you, you systemize 80%, you humanize 20%. So a lot of people try to systemize the 20%, yeah. the what ifs. And, and at the end of the day, you got to go, okay, you know what? Let's just systemize the bulk of what's going on. I like this one. The rest. And I think a lot of people, they get it backwards because, you know, a lot of property managers are operators. So to them, they want it perfect. And, 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 you know, that's okay. But, you know, having a perfect company go out of business because you've got the best systems doesn't help anybody. And I think that, you know, understanding where your value is and, and what you bring to the table, like you said, the, you know, the drip campaigns, you know, in emails, right? That's, that's systemizing 80% of the people. You get them, you put them in a drip campaign, you're good to go. Now you're going to have the others that, that you don't, but I think that's important to understand what are some of the things that you can systemize that will constantly reach out and touch people. And you can, you know, again, lead simple. You can do all that content with Alex. I mean, that, that's, that's where it comes in of utilizing. I don't need to become an expert marketer. I just need to hire people that know marketing. I hire people like Alex, these other people that know what they're doing. I don't, I don't need to learn accounting to run a company. I hire accountants, same thing. And I think that's the misconception a lot of people have. Um, and like you said, Mike, I mean, property managers, if you have them doing a bunch of things, the one thing that they're good at and the one thing that you hired them for, which is property management, they're not going to do good because you're having them do a whole bunch of things. Whereas if you hired a BDM that just did BDM, and, and by the way, I think it's important to understand that there is a difference in sales and there's a difference in marketing. Some people rub it together. They go sales and marketing, two different disc profiles, two different people. A marketing person is all about data. Um, and, every, and Alex knows my, my marketing guy, Kevin, he is a data guy. He wants to know cost acquisition per lead, per strategy. I mean, it's all spreadsheets and numbers, right? That's his strength. But that, I mean, do you agree with that, Alex? Different oh, disc oh I do. I worked with Kevin for a long time. You realize this, right? Yeah. <laughs> I saw him grow up. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and I, and I think that's the important thing. A lot of people need to, to, uh, to understand, especially in this industry, because things are changing. And like you said, Mike, you know, just because you have the best systems and processes, you get a big company that, that rolls in or, or, you know, company that can spin it better. You may be better, but it's, it's not, it's, it's how you present it. And sometimes these companies have the dollars to be able to. Now I, I would counter what you're saying about the paper click in the sense that, you know, having the reviews, having the ranking on Google, having all those things, having the, you know, I've got, I don't know, I, I probably have about 300 video blogs on my website of me talking about all the different problems owners have. I sell a book on vlog topics. I mean, there's stuff that you can do that is not a monetary thing, but it actually humanizes you and it allows um, people to see you as the educator because my understanding is nowadays marketing is not the big Coca-Cola they want to watch the guy who's the CEO of Coca-Cola on Instagram and see how he lives. That's more of the marketing that they want to see. They don't want to see the big production. They want to get to know you, the person and go, how are you the person going to be the one that I want to hire? And so, and I remember Alex, you know, one of your PM growth summits and you, when you had Marcus Sheridan there, the first one that I saw him. And I think he said the average pages that people look at is like 72. If I recall, it was a huge number that they look at before they've even gone on and called you they've already done their homework on your website so that tells me they're either sold or not sold just by your website 70 percent yeah 70 percent of the buying cycle happens without you taking any sort of participation in it except through your content and the information you're willing to share with your uh, audience with the, yeah with the people i wanted to i wanted to so a couple of things uh steve maybe i can i can do this um um little tweak for you or at least uh, uh, have you think about this little trick to help you get uh, more qualified leads walking into your BDM's hands faster, right? Because you said your first line of defense is your VAs who are qualified, competent people. I get that 100%. 
uh, we've seen more success now with actually going uh, outside of a convention to have a very simple form. You want to sort of start introducing complexity into your form. Not a lot, but at least require the property address, right? Require them to designate who they are. So have options and the form needs to sort of morph based on their prof profile. So the first thing they see, I am a and then investor is a toggle, right? With property in Houston or investor with property and just have that form uh, morph a little bit. Don't know if you do that. I haven't checked your website in a while, Steve. I don't think we do. But That's good. That will help you qualify those leads um, a lot better when they come in. So you decide, okay, do I send my VA on this or this is, because I have the same thing, man. I have 16 different forms people fill out from downloading some spreadsheets, um, with, with like how to uh, figure out BDM pay and, and I, I do unit economics, like all kinds of eBooks on my website versus free consultation. When you fill that out and you give me your information about your company, Logan is on this. Like that's, that's my customer. You, you manage, you manage a portfolio of properties. You're looking to grow significantly fast. You've, uh, um, you want to talk to Logan, um, everything else we'll put them in the drip. It also actually will, because obviously we do this because four and a half does our, our websites and helps us with all our marketing, but there's also a toggle down for tenant. So if they click tenant, it's going to weed that out immediately. So you're not wasting your time calling like and finding out on a phone call. Let me look at your form, Steve, while you guys talk amongst yourself. For a well, this is the first, I want to make the second point. So oh, yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a, 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 a tremendous opportunity for you to, to sort of um, uh, optimize your labor. Uh, and optimize your BDM's time because sometimes it's worth the BDM actually making that first touch. I agree. And it's funny because that, that is what I was saying. We're actually thinking of changing up a bit because I think where we're losing leads is in that filter between the time the, the, the VA or VAs talk to them and they do a fantastic job. But I think where we're losing that is let's say, let's say they say, Oh, I can set up appointment tomorrow morning for the, for the BDM to talk to you. Well, Statistically, they're talking to three or four other companies as soon as they hang up the phone with me. Quite possibly. So yep. Car shopping, right? The last thing you want to do is have the car salesman call you after you've just been on three lots. You're like, you know what? I'm good. Thanks. I appreciate it. You know, no big deal. And that's the thing. Maybe they called us first, but maybe they talked to other companies and, and, you know, a lot of companies know who we are and they may say, oh yeah, you know, they'll say a lot of times, who have you talked, who have you talked to? Well, I'm calling Empire. I'm calling this, I'm calling that. And then they go, yeah, we do the same as Empire. And they're like, you do? I'm like, oh yeah, we do exactly the same, but we're a little bit cheaper. Ah, okay. Because again, you got to understand, I think that the, the challenge is, is you got to remember that the investor themselves, for the most part, they're, they're an unsophisticated owner. What I, what I mean by that is, is they just want their problem solved now. They really don't give a shit about, you know, the specifics for the initial conversation, right? They're taking at face value what people are telling them because it's not like a B2B where you know all your data, you know all your information. This is someone who owns one property. Maybe they just bought it. Maybe they're reluctant landlord, like, like Mike said, they're moving out of town for a couple of years and they're coming back. They just want this kind of done and over with. This is kind of something that they, they really don't want to deal with. They just want it over with. So to, to, to deal with it right away or to say, you know what? Okay. I'll wait two days or a day or an hour or whatever they want. Like you said, this is a now society and people want their questions answered now. They don't necessarily want to wait. And if someone else can answer that question, it may not be better, but it's speed is the key. And I think that's the one thing that we're learning is if we can get to them quicker, which basically means BDM, that's the key. Well, and what also means answer the phone, right? Answer the phone. It, I think Alex and I talked about this early on. I think that Marcus Sheridan may have, may have uh, touched upon it as well, is if you don't answer the phone, you lose, it's like an 80% chance you're not getting that client. You're, 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 you're right. Significantly. I don't know the exact numbers, but that's why you have that row of people. If it comes in and that person's unavailable, goes to the next one, goes to the next one. And you answer that phone immediately because getting back in touch with them, you'd be leaving message and that's what the follow-up is, but calling them and calling them and calling them, trying to get them on. And we had this at an early age in my family because we had a property management hotline <laughs> in our house and it wasn't about sales. It was just about service. Yes. And if we didn't answer that phone in two rings, we had a property management hotline. You would see three kids like sprinting through the hallways, trying to get to that phone call before because we didn't know if it was going to be a tenant or it could be, you know, my uncle or my father who are all into the real estate industry, you had to answer it. And we had that same thing here in this office. We answer the phone because most companies you call, you get all these voicemails. 
yeah. right? You can't get, a, get through to somebody. And I think it's important to still answer that call, whether it's your virtual assistant or whether it's somebody. The, whoever it is, they answer the phone call. And that's like one of the biggest steps. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting, and Alex, I don't know, you may know some statistics, but the majority of our leads that come in are, are online. Um, we get a phone number and we do call them back. The first thing is always the call, but the, we don't get a lot of phone calls coming in. A lot of them are, are through it's our usually eighty twenty. It's about eighty percent usually digital. Been, in your case, it's a lot more digital because you heavily, you heavily digitally invested, right? You don't Correct. send out postcards. By the way, you and I should talk about this. You should consider doing uh, postcards. I think that's your next frontier on marketing. I think you've. I think you create new interests that you wouldn't get from digital channels and then you pull them in into your digital channel, brother, and then, and then you convert them. Right. So I think the postcard is your next frontier. I'm looking at your form. I want to give the advice to people who are watching this show or empireindustriesllc.com forward slash Houston dash property dash management. And I'm looking at your form. The first thing that says on the form is a first name. The only qualifier, so first name, last name, email, phone number, it's all good. Rental property postal code. I don't know why you call it postal code. Well, um, you know, the reason, so I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why. And maybe I mean, it's, it's a HubSpot form, right? Well, it's a, it's a HubSpot form. And it's also because we have, you know, we're in three different cities. So what happens is, is that goes in geographically when it comes in. Sure, I HubSpot. get that. Don't they call them zip codes though? Not all over the world. I see. Okay. So, fine. You know, fine. fine. Yeah, so, so there's some thought into this. People yeah. know the just, you didn't just, uh, I get yeah. it. I just want to get to this. And then the last one says here, inquiry type one, and it's required field. It says general inquiry, vendor request, property availability, other. Those are your four options. Now, which one would you send to a BDM? General inquiry, vendor request, property availability, other. My answer to you is none. Yeah. Right. So on top of the form, I think the first thing is a VP of marketing. What I would do, Steve, I would go walk in, like walk out of this podcast, go into I mean, to your HubSpot, whoever does your forms and write the first field should be, I am interested in the first pre field should be. So I'm interested in as the required field. The first should be Houston property management, then Austin property, whatever the three cities you have. Then you should say, I have a tenant inquiry. And then, uh, um, and that's it. I want it or other, right? I, I would just say Houston property management. What, what, what other cities you're in? Help me out Houston, here. Houston, Dallas, and Fort Worth. Yeah. So Houston property management, Dallas property management, Fort Worth. I have a tenant inquiry. And then when they require, when there's a property management inquiry, make the property address a required field. Ah. Right. If they don't have, they don't give you a property. Now your leads will, will go, you, you will right away lose about the, 30% of your leads. <laughs> right, but here's the, here's the thing. Here's the thing, Alex. Here's the, here's the question. But the KPI, yeah, go ahead. So, again, we also help investors buy properties. Well, that, well make that an option. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, if, if they may say, I don't have an address because I'm looking to, I, I want you guys to help me purchase because we get a lot of investors out of country and stuff. And so we'd have to. That's fantastic. Them. So Houston Property Management, and then you have, um, then the, the, and I would test this, right? But I would definitely put, but this is a Houston, do you have another website or this, this website yeah, serves yeah. all? No, we have one for uh, Dallas and one for Fort Worth. Excellent. So then all you have to do here is Houston property management, investor looking to acquire property in Houston area. Like I would write this out. And then tenant, uh, uh, existing tenant interested uh, or new, you know, new, new property inquiry for, for tenants. You know how to word this out. Don't, don't make yeah. me say these things. But right now, Right now, you wouldn't know what to do here. General inquiry, vendor request, property availability, and other. So there you have it. One takeaway. Question on that. For this? Are you charging him for this, Alex? <laughs> <laughs> no, Steve is a friend. He's buying me beers left and right. <laughs> That's right. Um, so the question on this. Can you, it, on, these, on these forms, and this, this may be a HubSpot question, but can you make these forms where they're like, if this, then that, where yeah. all of a sudden it's no, it propagates a whole new set of questions? That's, that's the whole idea, right? You want to choose, like, I don't want to be limited by what technology can give me. I want to find a way to deliver the outcome I'm looking to deliver for my marketing team and for my co company. So I'm sure HubSpot can do it, but if not, get something that can. The form needs to morph based yeah. on the profile, right? So if it's a Houston property manager, property management inquiry, then the first thing it needs to be property address, right? 
And then you need to fill in their first name, last name, and whatever information you need. I wouldn't be afraid to have five or six fields in the form just because if somebody's serious about this, they want to know you are serious. If I'm sending you a general inquiry with just my name and email, that doesn't seem like very serious to me. But be prepared. You will break your KPIs doing this, Steve. You will have go from 200 leads to probably 100. Well, that's fine because, I mean, the, the thing is, is are they really leads? You will hit your numbers, though. Yeah, right. Because the BDMs will actually call the high value leads, while the rest will be will go through the same process you have. Yeah, but I mean, that out. They become white noise, you know, when it's right. too much, and you don't you miss the important leads because you're going through and you're filtering through, and that's one of the reasons, you know, we have the the, the VA team. I mean, we have a team of three virtual assistants that all their job is is to basically to call back, to touch up. They do all the follow ups too with the BDMs after, like so they'll do all the. Um, secondary follow-ups, you know, the, the six months down the road, call me then, they, they take care of all that because that's not a strength of a BDM, right? The BDM strength is talking, negotiating, closing. And that's, I want them focused on what they do best, not all the things that they should be doing. Exactly, exactly. That's really good. So you put them on an order, you know, you, somebody who's not ready to buy right now is, is that's, that, that's a perfect use for VA to continuously follow up until they surface the opportunity. Then again, they got to pipe it into the BDM's yeah, hands yeah, exactly. to, to close yeah. it. I'm on Mike's website right now. And if like this one, so he's got a couple of things. And by the way, it's rec R E C dash rentals.com. And he's got the first call to action. The first form, so to speak is I want free rental analysis. That's on the owner side of, uh, and that has a property address. Obviously if somebody wants, free rental analysis, they got to give us the property address. And so that qualifies people in or out right there. We have um, a lot of luck with ours. With, Mike, do you have a lot of luck with your rental uh, estimator? We, we actually get a lot of leads from that that actually convert. Yeah, no, I think it's great. It's, it's a, people are, that's most of the calls that come in, people are trying to find out what their property's worth and as, yeah. as far as the rental side. So it works out really well. It gives us a good touch point and it gives us, it gives us a good reason to follow up. And we have a nice form that get, gets completed and, um, you know, our part, they're not always perfectly accurate, but we, we uh, review it and we make sure that if it is off, we, we do some research prior and let them know and say, hey, this is what the report comes out. This is pulling from all these different areas. And, and we did a little additional research and they, t they tend to like that because it becomes really personal because it's not just fill out the form and then this analysis gets shot out to them. It's somebody physically reaching out to them and, and it's more of a personal touch, uh, but it works pretty well. It you almost you hope it, it is off. Sorry, Steve, you almost hope it is off because then you can really showcase your expertise, right? Because if the, the automatic rental analysis is off, I'll let me just finish this point. So on Steve, on Mike's website, if you just go to the form itself, which is on the footer of every single page, there's three options. A tenant with a maintenance issue, an owner interested in management services in need of something else. Those are the three options he has. So if somebody says an owner interested in services. Now, Mike, we don't have a property address in this, in this form right now, but I don't think we've had problems with getting too many uh, leads that don't qualify, right? I, I, I don't think that's the case. Once people identify themselves as an owner, they usually are. Question. Yeah, definitely less leads, but more qualified. Right. So, so that was, uh, yeah, that was my question. Do you, do you track that, Mike, as far as like, okay, how many how many leads are you getting from there and the conversion rate of that actual contact form or no? Yeah, we absolutely track all that. Yeah. So we track all that report on that every 90 days with when we sit down with Mike's team, because you know, people try to do, this is another thing, Steve, maybe you can help. You know, the, the EOS is a weekly cadence. I just don't think we have as like a small business, we have enough statistically valid, data set not not enough data to make any kind of real pivots and decisions people try to optimize on the weekly cadences in marketing and i think that's silly i'll be honest yeah. with you you I have to have at least a 90 day cycle to understand like you have statistically valid sample that that goes through a couple of months of iterations and then you can make a decision and pivot like why would you pivot every week yeah i don't think you could do it weekly we do it monthly um, and the reason, you know, 90 days could be a long time to make that pivot. And what I mean mm. by that, you may go through a full cycle. So what, what, what we start looking at is, is year over year data. So all of a sudden we start looking at data and we go, you know what, statistically, the first week of January is always down. 
So we may say, you know what, it doesn't make sense to put that much money into marketing the first week of January because we know statistically we just don't get that many leads. We could put $5,000 in, we could put $20,000 in, we're not going to get as many leads. So does it make sense to market? It may or may not. But if you don't know that data, you don't know it. So I think 90 days is a little bit too long to pivot, in my opinion, um, because you're looking back. You're going, in March, you're going, yeah, in January, we kind of sucked and we overspent our budget by X dollars. But that was, now it's like, okay, well, that was, that was January. So we're already into April. We're kicking butt now because it's going into the summer months. So I think it may be a little bit too long. I think we track ours every week in EOS just to make sure that the trends are aligned with the year prior. So that, that's why we're looking at it to go, okay, you know what, man, last year we got 50 leads on week two. This week we only got five. Are we, is there something? Are we doing something? So not to make a decision, but it's just more to look at the data so that we're not being reactionary. Um, but you're right. You, you, you could very easily go the other way and, and react too quickly, I think. You yeah, over correct. Go ahead, Mike. And also, um, you, you do the 90-day check, but that's a very in-depth check, right? We also do monthly checks where we're kind of keeping an eye on things, seeing where things are going. So it doesn't mean you can't make some sort of move if you think it's, it's necessary. So we are keeping an eye on it, but we do the 90-day is the full blown check of where the leads came from, where the money should be going and how it worked. You can look monthly as well. And then we also look at each BDM, you know, how they're doing, how they're following up, how their leads are coming in, how, what their closing ratio is. And, and then we have chats with them as well and kind of see where we can improve and how things are going with them. So we don't do it weekly, but we do it monthly with, with the BDMs. We do it monthly with the company just as a, a soft check. And then after 90 days, we do the, the more detailed check as well. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, I think this is, this was a good, I mean, we could spend another hour here, um, but I'll, I want to be kind to. Not to interrupt, Alex, but the thing is, I think the important part for anyone who listens to this and is looking to either have start having a BDM in your office or has one already, you're going to have to mold it to what makes sense for you and your market. You could start it and you can listen to anything in the world about what's happening around other property management companies, but you got to make it work for you. And that's what I think we do. We're continuously trying to change and look at what makes sense. Because look, a BDM, we've had a BDM for a year and a half or a couple of them. And it takes time to figure out what the right processes are for anything, whether it's a follow-up, whether it's when we check our data, you know, all that stuff. You just have to continue to look at it and grow and be willing to change to make it fit. And, and I, I would say that just kind of you know, closing, closing that loop for Mike, I think it's really a matter of any company realizing that you got to put the right person in the right seat doing the right job. So, you know, I think it's don't try to have one end all be all. I think that saving money that way is actually not saving money. I think you're actually, you could be spending or practically wasting money if you have someone that's the wrong disc profile doing the wrong job. It's just not going to work because you're trying to save a couple dollars. You got to remember, you know, to me, definitions are everything. And, and investing in marketing is different than thinking you're spending money in marketing. And I think, you, you know, a lot of people have that because they're operators at heart, they don't really think about investing in marketing and having a salesperson and a marketing person and understanding truly what the definition of a marketer is, what the different definition of a salesperson, an operator. So I, I think that, you know, make sure you really realize what is that role, what are the duties of that role, and what is the disc profile of that role. And I think that would help set the right baseline. Yeah, and I think a lot of a lot of companies that I've talked to, and it depends on what your goals are as a company. Some people like to just stay steady and have a good, great, steady income. They're maybe not looking to to conquer the world like Steve is. <laughs> uh, but uh, ultimately, you have to see, and I, I think some of the biggest issues that I look at is if somebody's really trying to grow, it's the owner of the company who's taking a lot of this business development calls, right? Yeah. And what I noticed is when I took myself out of the equation, and we all know if we own a company, we're probably the best, we, we think we're the best closers, we the best. Is, right? We think we are, but we know our company inside and out. We know the in industry inside and out. But what I noticed, you know, I think it was about eight years ago, is I took myself out of that equation. I stopped managing properties. I stopped being a BDM. I stopped making those calls, which is hard, because all the clients are, are used to talking to you. You think you're the best closer that can possibly be hired. Um, but if you get these people in place and you can help watch them and help them grow and put, set them up for success, number one, they're going to pay for themselves because of the money they're bringing in. And number two, you're gonna free up your time to really work on concentrating on the company itself 
rather than in the company, right? Because you start working on the day-to-day -day tedious stuff, you can't grow your company. So I think that's something I see in this industry a lot and it's hard to let go. Trust me, it was so hard for me to let go, but I knew eventually I would. <clears throat> and it ultimately was one of the best moves that I made is to, to let go of the day-to-day, -day, let go of following up on potential new clients and really work on the company and build a team around me that can do it. And really trust those employees, train them, trust them. And that's kind of what we, what we developed. And be, there are gonna be mistakes on the way from every, everybody, but if you, have confidence in them and train them and they can do a great job and have great employees, it will work out in the best for, for your company in the long run. And think of how much time you have to work on your hair. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Time when you don't have your hair. Save so that time, yeah. That. I'm, I'm blow and go, man. I'm good to go. Yeah, that's why uh, you get so much done. <laughs> hi guys, I'm trying to wrap this this show up man, three Hi. times already, man. You guys are amazing. This is, it's a lot of fun to spend time with. Like I said, we can do this. Like I, I just found another thing, a lot of like huge conversion opportunity for you, Steve. I'll just throw it in there before live chat, bro. We get 30% of our online leads through chat because really? of a question we ask automatically on the chat. And the question is, what is missing in your marketing strategy that gets them start talking? Because right away, if somebody says, oh, I'm not a property manager, or oh, I'm not, nothing is missing. Like, okay, we're not going to chat with you. I don't want to waste my time. But I have Logan, my highest quality BDM, and Anna, his assistant, on this chat monitoring for, um, and when we ask that question, usually they read some kind of content. It provokes a response. We get in the conversation. Dude, we get a lot of really good leads that way. Like so that. your chat is an opportunity because right now it just says start chat. And I bet not very many people start chat, except tenants and folks who are selling you stuff. And this is something that we're in the process of working on as well, because yep. we've had the chat line for quite some time. And then the question is, how many different chat lines do you have? Who's, who's uh, you know, watching the chat line? Who's responding to the chat line? Uh, so this is something that we are in the process of trying to work out and see what makes the most sense. I like that. That's another one. I got. I, I owe you two drinks now, man. I'll, I'll All right, buddy. Yeah, two, yeah. I'm only light beer now, so I'm on a keto diet. That's oh, nice, it. dude. I'm a, I'm a challenge. So I'm 211 pounds. Next time we talk, I'll be probably 202, uh, and then I'm going to 180, 185. That's the challenge. 185, and in, in, let's call it. Uh, I don't know, 15 weeks. Nice. All right, let's do it. Gentlemen, thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Um, hopefully, our audience got a lot of takeaways. Until next time. Be well. See you guys. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.